Hello everybody, today a JM double bill. That's right, two videos for the price of one car vertical ad. First up, my journalistic impressions of this, the 2013 Infiniti FX. And second, why absolutely none of that matters at all, and regardless of what any journalist thought of it, this car and the Infiniti brand was doomed to fail. <laughs> Today's video has inspired you to head to the classifieds in search of an infinity or beyond. Don't forget to use Car Vertical, the super powered super search that cross references a number of databases from around the globe to bring you all the information you want to know on any potential used car purchase, from things like outstanding finance to usage as a taxi, accident damage, regardless of whether a car has been written off or not, and things like common faults and failure points on any model you might be looking at. Car Vertical can give you all of this in around 60 seconds, and all you require is a registration or VIN number. For 10% off, don't forget to use my link in the comment section or the description down below. I wager that the majority of people currently watching may not be familiar with the FX or the Infiniti brand as a whole. So, to bring you up to speed, Infiniti is to Nissan what Lexus is to Toyota. It is their premium arm, intended really to sell more upmarket cars at a higher price, chiefly to the American market. However, they also made a go of it in Europe, though it was such a roaring success in the UK, they no longer exist. This car specifically is a member of the second generation of the FX, a car that became rebadged as the QX70. This specifically is the FX. X30 DS Premium, and at launch it cost £54,000. It was the largest car that they offered, and intended to compete really with the likes of the smaller Range Rover Sport, the Porsche Cayenne, and really stuff like the BMW X6, a car that often appeared in many a twin test with this. In its day, and I would say perhaps even more so now, the appeal of the Infiniti was really twofold. First off, it offered an awful lot of features and technology at a very competitive price, and it was a car that appealed to somebody who wanted to do something a little bit different. Like this car's current owner, Levi, who previously had a Range Rover Sport, the most conventional choice in the upmarket SUV segment. A car that Levi bought back in 2006, when, by his own admission, he was a very different man. And at the time, he wanted to prove himself and blend in with the successful set. So, a Range Rover was the natural choice. Wind the clock on a few years, and Levi instead found himself being the kind of person who'd rather stand out than blend in. So, with a limited budget of around £15,000, he set out trying to find a replacement for the Range Rover, which, I know it will surprise you to hear, hadn't been particularly reliable. He stumbled upon the Infiniti and thought, ah, perfect, that is the car for me. It's got all the toys I would ever want, it has a nice sporty look about it, and today on Auto Trader, the priciest of all FX or QX70 would set you back less than £20,000. In fact, around 15 grand will get you a top of the line example powered by the 5 litre naturally aspirated V8 that they did. Other engines in the lineup include the 3.7 litre petrol V6, which will be most familiar to people as the power plant in the Nissan 370Z, and this, the 3 litre single turbo developed in collaboration with Renault during the period of the Nissan Renault Alliance. This was an engine intended for the European market because one of the issues that Infiniti had was as a brand built by the Japanese, essentially for the Americans, they didn't really have any diesel experience. And unlike Honda, who with the legend stuck firmly to their guns, Nissan decided that for this, if they wanted to have any hope of sales in Europe, they really did need a diesel. And this in specification is just about all right. It makes 240 horsepower and 405 pound foot of torque. That's 550 newton meters. And in isolation, it's perfectly fine. It plays very well with the seven speed automatic gearbox that was the one and only transmission for the FX, and it certainly does a pretty good job of moving this 1.9 tonne car down the road. The engine, according to Infinity, was built more for refinement rather than outright power, so though it was down on, say, the German competition, it actually does a pretty decent job. And I have to say, though from in here it isn't the most refined thing, from outside you get none of the typical diesel clatter of the generation of engines that had come before. Oh, 
of perhaps greater interest to petrol heads, you have a double wishbone suspension at the front, a multi-link at the rear, and also rear wheel steer. So despite the fact it's not exactly a small car, it is much more agile than you might expect. And the steering is surprisingly good too. You get a little bit of speed behind you, 40 to 50 mile an hour, and the wheel weights up, becomes quite communicative. I'm really shocked at just how good this actually is. So much so that if there is no traffic oncoming, and there is no traffic oncoming, I'm gonna do a U-turn now, put it into manual mode, and see what it's like when you try and treat it like a bit of a sports car. You know something? I'm actually genuinely surprised at how engaging and interactive this car is to drive, and that's an area where I really had very, very low expectations indeed. Sure, you still have to appreciate the physics. It's near two tons, it isn't designed as the sportiest of things, but um, it does a much better job than you would reasonably expect. The brakes are also fairly decent, though nothing to write home about. The overall ride is also excellent. Though you still get the odd little bit of fidget here or there, it's actually quite composed. And I'd say this car does an excellent job of blending the comfort and sportiness you'd expect from a big 4x4, but that looks like this. I'm really quite attached to this thing. The highlight for me is that steering feel, quite wondrous. It also features adaptive dampers, which have two modes, auto and sport. Put it in sport and you'll feel a minor difference, but a difference nonetheless, and it will control the body in a decent way, but without removing that pitch and yaw that give you a good idea as to just how much you're really asking of the car. Though on paper it is a wide thing and in person does feel it, allegedly over two metres, I think that's more a case of Nissan, or Infiniti, being a little bit more honest with their numbers than some other manufacturers, who often negate to include the wing mirrors. So, um, though technically it's wider than a Range Rover, not so convinced that it is. You also have this glorious view out the bonnet, which is really quite sculpted and suave, and it's closest in concept, as far as I'm concerned, and I know this will sound daft, to either a Jaguar or a Ferrari 550. And because you can actually see a lot of said bonnets, you've also got a much better idea of where it is than you might expect. Many a Lexus that I've drove does suffer from having a huge bonnet that you can't see, leaving you a little bit uncertain as to where the rest of the car is. Now, in terms of the rest of the car, because it is a, I think, quite shapely looking thing, there is a compromise. Rear seat space is okay. It's good, not great, but the boot has suffered. For the vast majority of people, I'm sure it will be absolutely fine. There isn't really anything below the boot floor. You've got the subwoofer for the Bose stereo, which is it's all right, it's decent enough and, you know, above average, I'd say, for car stereos, but nothing to write home about. Now, I do appreciate that there are some people out there for whom having the biggest boot going is a genuine requirement. And if that's the case, the FX is not the car for you. But I think they made the fairly wise decision with this to go, you know what, not everybody needs that. And in fact, what a lot of people really want when they buy these cars is something a little bit sportier. Infinity knew that nearly nobody was actually going to take one of these cars off-road. It does have all-wheel drive, but I can't see any off-road modes. I can, though, see some buttons that um, I don't quite understand. One's for power door, and neither myself nor Levi have any idea what that does. There's IBA, which I think could be for some sort of intelligent collision assist, but what you will not find is a button for any sort of centre differential or transfer box or anything like that. And let's be honest, 99.99% .99 of people buying these cars in Britain didn't need that. What they would be far more interested in is the satellite navigation, which once upon a time was probably quite trick, which I'm told comes with a very upper class lady to tell you where it is you're supposed to go. In about eight miles, turn left. Then in 200 yards, keep to the left. Oh, you sultry temptress. And on top of that, you've also got the aforementioned Bose stereo. Very nice little clock in the middle here, quite a Maserati touch. You've got heated and ventilated seats, a sunroof up here, which I do appreciate, though it's not a panoramic item. And the uh, whole interior has plenty of interesting shapes and things going on. These leather seats have billion-way adjustment, and um, 
they're quite nice. I, I do really like them. At the £54,000 this would have cost you, it was comparable in price to your equivalent BMW X6, but when you looked at what you got for your money, this would have still been the better equipped car. So, though I don't think it was ever destined to sell in huge quantities, it probably should have done a little bit better than it did. After all, it seems like a fairly compelling package. Good looking, good to drive, nice big medium, fairly smooth diesel engine, although not the smoothest. It still makes a bit of racket from in here. However, this car was a sales disaster, and about a decade after it came out, Infinity is now a distant memory. So then, what was so wrong about the Infinity FX, and how did that lead to the downfall of the brand as a whole? Well, conveniently, I can answer both questions at the same time, and we'll begin the moment you open the door. And this really, I think, is as simple as it needs to be. You see, in Britain, and I think in Europe, we have a very different idea of quality to both the Japanese and the Americans. You see, the Japanese view quality as a depth of engineering, as reliability, and though Levi hasn't had this car for anywhere near as long as his Range Rover, I do wager it's going to be a little bit more reliable. And you get things like that lovely double wishbone and multi-link suspension, which many a BMW would not give you. Likewise, in America, they have generally different standards, and there they tend to like value for money. So they depreciate all the different features and functionality you get for your dollar. And over there, because they're very obsessed with Lexus, having a Japanese car isn't really something that bothers them all that much. But in Britain, we've become very accustomed to our premium cars being German. And that means we've become accustomed to German ideas of quality. And what that actually translates to for many people is the tactile element of a car, the quality of the materials, the feel of the things that you touch. VW, I think, really are quite responsible for making this such a priority. And the fact is, here, Infinity completely and totally missed the boat, because much of the switchgear in here is lifted directly from many a Nissan product. And the fact is, it just isn't good enough in a premium car. These window switches, the memory switches here, the ones on the wheel, the ones for the infotainment, they all feel like they're off just about any other Nissan product because they are. Even Lexus know that you do have to put a little bit of effort in, and though their switches aren't as nice as ones in, say, an S-Class or a 7 Series, they're still nicer than what you get in a Corolla. Yes, the car has leather seats, but why isn't there leather here, here, Alcantara up here? The sun visors, they're just... They're just not nice enough. All the touch points in here, they have a feeling of being slightly plasticky, slightly cheaper, and that is a real shame because the product itself clearly is very well engineered. And the truth is that most British people would just open the door and go, oh, it is just a Nissan, but for more money, isn't it? I won't even try it. But if they did get to try it, then they'd start to notice other things, like the fact that this engine may be down on power compared with an equivalent BMW, but unfortunately it is also worse in terms of fuel economy and CO2. In fact, compared with the X6 of the time, the 40D variant, this has some 70 fewer horses and uh, still puts out, I think, about 10 to 20 percent more in terms of CO2. And to tax one of these cars today will set you back about £615, though somehow it's also ULES compliant. Now, though that may be a figure that just about anybody looking at buying a posh SUV may be able to put up with, the fuel economy is not. Your BMW of the era would be doing close to 40 to the gallon, but as an average, this has achieved 31.6 which means that with the current cost of diesel being as high as it is versus petrol, I'm not entirely convinced that getting the V8 would actually be that much more expensive. And tragically for Infinity, though I'm sure most people watching, being of a petrol-heady type, would agree that a car like this requires a nice, big, girthy engine to pull it along. The reality is most people in Britain developed an appetite for buying big cars with little engines. So had they done this with a two-litre diesel, though it would have been wholly inappropriate, and I suspect that's why they didn't do it, people probably would have bought that. 
Don't ask me why. I don't make the rules, but that's what British people love to do. And then you get to the most painful and obvious truth of them all, which is that Infinity, I think, just never put the effort in. Lexus, over a very, very long time, have tried really, really hard to market to UK audiences, but still, it's not a roaring success. Partly, I think that is down to the model lineup, the engines and gearboxes that they use, but partly the fact that here in Britain we are still somewhat attached to our German cars. However, with some effort, you will gain some ground. But Infinity never really wanted to put that effort in, and so the cars simply never sold. As a result, because interest was so low, the depreciation on these was absolutely crippling. I once was offered an Infiniti saloon to drive and I asked the chap why he'd bought it. He said to me, well, because it was a nice upmarket luxury saloon car with a hybrid V6 that had plenty of poke, I think also all-wheel drive, and when new it had been over £40,000. However, at just two years old it was £18,000. He was very bitter about that fact because he'd paid £18,000 for it and then found another year later it was only worth £8,000. When that sort of stuff starts happening, it's very, very difficult to keep a brand alive because even if you do get somebody that has become convinced by the car, they'll run their finance numbers and they'll find out that actually that BMW that on paper is a lot more money in terms of a monthly is actually less. And so, there we go. That is a short little video on why the Infiniti FX is actually a very good car. Much better, I think, than the three out of five stars that it was given, and is today genuinely something different and quite interesting, which I'll always approve of, but was always doomed to fail by some fairly fundamental and painfully obvious design and marketing choices. A shame, really, because I think this was a brand that really had some serious potential. Anyway, I would like to say a huge thank you to Levi for bringing his car out, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.